today I want to clarify some things um, about vector spaces, subspaces, um, dimension, and coordinates. Specifically, the difference between the column space of a matrix and a basis for the column space. So let's remind ourselves of some things. Here we have a matrix and the reduced echelon form of the matrix. So one of the first things I want to point out is that we notice that uh, we, when we want, let's suppose that I ask the question, do the columns of A span R3? Uh, the answer is no, because A does not have a pivot in, e, in every column. So one of the things that we are still writing that we need to stop writing is that the reduced echelon form of A does not have a pivot in every column. When you write it that way, it sounds like you are implying that the pivots of the reduced echelon form are different than the pivots of A, and they're not. So we use the reduced echelon form to find the pivots, but it is A that does not have a pivot in every row. When you write the reduced echelon form of A does not have a pivot in every row, it makes me think, it makes me believe that you think that the pivots are different in the reduced echelon form and the matrix, because otherwise you wouldn't say the reduced echelon form does not have a pivot in every row. So you don't want to say the reduced echelon form does not have a pivot in every row, even though that's technically true. That's not the, what we're using to draw our conclusion. The columns of A do not span R3 because A does not have a pivot in every row. When you write, the, another way to think about it is when you write the reduced echelon form of A does not have a pivot in every row, you are asking me to infer that you understand that since the reduced echelon form of A does not have a pivot in every row, that A itself does not have a pivot in every row. But you can't make that assumption about your reader. You're asking your reader to make an inference that you shouldn't be requiring that they make. So that's why I was picky about you saying A does not have a pivot in every row instead of the reduced or echelon form of A does not have a pivot in every row. So uh, similarly for columns. The other thing that you want to note is that A is a matrix. The columns of A are a set of vectors. So the columns of A do not span R3 because A does not have a pivot in every row. The columns of A, a set of vectors, is what spans R3 or doesn't span R3. The matrix is the thing that has the pivots. So we need to know there's a difference between the columns of A and the matrix A. And then what makes it more complicated is that we've added this other layer. There's a vector space that's attached to A as well called the column space of A. So notice that we would want to say here that the columns of A, that's a set of vectors, the columns of A do not span R3. since A does not have a pivot in every row. Notice here uh, also, as far as me being picky about your answers, I have named this matrix A. This matrix is the reduced echelon form of A and they are not equal to each other. So that's important. Don't put an equal sign in between. A cannot simultaneously be both of these matrices because they're not the same. X cannot equal two and five at the same time. So when we write the columns of A do not span R3 since A does not have a pivot in every row, we're dealing with the named matrix. You don't want to say since the matrix does not have a pivot in every row because there is no the matrix in this problem. You were given the matrix A and the reduced echelon form of A so when you say the matrix, I'm like, oh, which matrix are you talking about? A or the reduced echelon form of A? 
And once again, you're requiring the reader to make an inference that or to, you're requiring the reader to assume that you understand that there is no difference in the pivots of A and the reduced echelon form of A. The best policy is to remove all doubt and say that A does not have a pivot in every row. And that's the reason that you can say the columns of A do not span R3. So you want to leave as little to enter, you don't want to leave anything up to your reader to infer, uh, you don't want to require that your reader infer something from your writing. You want to say exactly what you need to say. Now, with that in mind, since it's come up, that does not mean that you should write more. Writing more has gotten a lot of people into trouble because you've said the columns of A do not span R3 since A does not have a pivot in every row. Then you'll be like all the augmented matrix could have a pivot in the rightmost column. At which point I'm like, oh, what augmented matrix? You just said the augmented matrix. There's no augmented matrix here. This is just the matrix A and the reduced echelon form of A. When you write the augmented matrix, all of a sudden you're telling the reader that there's some augmented matrix running around and there isn't. It's just A and the reduced echelon form of A. The only time you want to say the words augmented matrix is when there is an augmented matrix in front of you. And the only time you're going to be looking at the columns of the augmented matrix is when is to look to see if there is a pivot in the rightmost column of the augmented matrix. All that stuff has to be there. You don't just want to say pivot in the rightmost column because we only care about the rightmost column when we're dealing with an augmented matrix. You don't even want to bring up the augmented matrix when you're not dealing with an equation or you don't have an augmented matrix given to you. So you have to be very careful with your language. So the columns of A do not span R3 since A does not have a pivot in every row. The columns of A is a set of vectors. That's what does the spanning. A is the matrix. That's what has the pivots. So on top of this, we have the column space of A is the span of the columns of A. That is, the column space of A is all the linear combinations of the columns of A. So when we write the column space of A, this is a subspace of R3, and that means it has an infinite number of vectors. So we would not want to say that the column space of A is just these two vectors we see that the first and third vectors, A1 and A3, those form a basis for the column space of A. So we describe a vector space with a basis So if we wrote column space of A is one, two, negative three, and two, negative five, six. When you write this this way, you are saying that the column space of A is only these two vectors, but that's never the case. The column space of A could never just be two vectors. The column space of A is all the linear combinations of these two vectors. What you're trying to say is that this is a basis for the column space of A. So when you say that there's a, this is the basis for the column space of A, that's when you just list those two vectors. That's how we describe a vector space. But if you just write the column space of A is these two vectors, you're saying that the only two things in the column space of A are those two vectors. So notice that A is three by four. So the column space of A is a subspace of R3. So the column space of A is a two-dimensional subspace of R3. So the column space of A is a two-dimensional subspace of R3. The 
it's the span of these two vectors. Everything that's a linear combination of these two vectors, everything that's a linear combination of these two vectors is in R3. So we would not want to say that the column space of A is R2, because that doesn't make sense. 1, 2, negative 3 is not in R2, it's in R3. We're looking at a plane in R3. That plane is isomorphic to R2 and through coordinates, it's pretty much R2, but it is not R2. It's not equal to R2. So that's what I wanted to point out here. This is a basis for the column space of A. Note that if I give this basis a name, Now that I have a basis for the column space of A, I can write coordinates for any vector in the column space of A. So for example, we see over here that A4 is just two times A1 plus three times A3. And we see that A2 is just negative three times A1. So we can write coordinates of, the ve of any vector in the column space of A relative to the basis A1 and A3. So we would say that the uh, A2, the coordinates of A2 relative to the basis B are negative three times the first vector and zero times the third vector. And the coordinates of A4 relative to B will be two times A1 plus three times A2. So this is because A2 is negative three A1 plus zero A3. And A4, the coordinates of A4 relative to B are two, three because A4 is two times A1 plus three times A3. So mainly I wanted to correct that we can't just write column space of A as these two vectors. It's, these two vectors form a basis for the column space of A. For the null space of A, we need to solve the homogeneous equation AX equals zero. So the null space of A oops. The null space of A is the solution set to AX equals zero. So for the null space of A, we, uh, to find a basis for the null space of A, we just want to write the solution set to AX equals zero in parametric vector form. Now, <clears throat> in this case, these four columns correspond to the vectors A1, A2, A3, and A4. A is not an augmented matrix. We're looking at the solution set to a homogeneous equation. So there's an X1. These are scalars, an x2, an x3, and an x4. We're looking at the solution set to x1, a1, plus x2, a2, plus x3, a3, plus x4, a4 equals 0. That's what this equation looks like. x1 scalar, a1 vector, plus x2 scalar, a2 vector, and so on. So we can start off by writing the general solution to the equation based on the reduced echelon form. So x1 is equal to um, negative 2, uh, sorry, 
three, uh, three x two minus two x four. X two is free. X three is equal to negative three x four and x4 is free. So we can see the reason that I like listing, I always list things out in order. I just count down x or count up x1, x2, x3, and x4. Listing free variables when I hit free variables and solving for the basic variables in terms of the free variables when I have to is that this will remind me that the null space of A is a subspace of R4. So that when I go to write the solution in parametric vector form, I can see I need these two vectors, an x2 vector, where we get 3, 1, 0, 0, and the x4 vector, because that's the other free variable. So negative 2, 0, negative 3, 1. So this helps us helps remind us that the null space of A, or writing everything in order, making sure you just start off at one and end when you get to the last one, reminds us that the null space of A is a two-dimensional subspace of R4. That makes sense. Since A is three by four, the column space is a subspace of R3 the null space is a subspace of R4. So we wouldn't want to write that the null space of A is these two vectors. That wouldn't be what we were trying to say. Because if we write this, then we're saying that these are the only two solutions to AX equals zero, but that's not the case. We can have zero solutions, one solution, or infinitely many solutions. Two is not an option. You cannot have exactly two solutions to any equation, a linear equation. What we're trying to say is that a basis for the null space of A is these two vectors. Notice that these are not columns of A. Notice they're also not rows of A. They're the solution set, they're uh, a basis for the solution set to the homogeneous equation AX equals zero. Any questions? Basis for or basis of, that's that's fine. If you wrote basis of null A, that's fine. I think I've used basis of in the past. I think on some of the stuff that I've written, I just wrote basis null A. So I went full caveman style. Basis null A, and then I write the two vectors. Another thing to note that I wasn't too picky on in grading this particular question. Um, you shouldn't. You shouldn't try to do that. You shouldn't make an effort. I know you're trying. And that that students are always trying to be as efficient as possible. They always want to write as little as possible. But you shouldn't like aim for caveman style. Another thing to note is that when you write a basis for the null space of A, it is a set of two vectors. So it should be contained in these curly braces. I didn't take off for that because you're just listing a set of vectors, which was fine. But you should, if you're like a basis for the null space of A is gonna be the set of vectors, the standard should be a set of curly braces containing your set of vectors. We tend to use curly braces to denote first sets 
You don't want to use parentheses because we use parentheses for a lot of other things. We use parentheses for coordinate for ordered ordered pairs, ordered triples, ordered n tuples, which would include writing vectors horizontally. Um, and we use it for open intervals. So parentheses are already doing a lot of work. So use the curly ones. Use your Alfred Hitchcock's for set notation. Square brackets would be wrong because we're not writing a matrix. Square brackets are what we're, especially in this context, that because we're using square brackets to denote vectors, if you drop some square brackets around this, you're giving me a matrix. And you wouldn't want to say the basis for the null space is this matrix, is a matrix with these two columns, because that's not what things look like. Things in the null space of A look like vectors in R4, not four by two matrices. That goes back to um, my original comments at the top, the difference between the columns of a matrix as a set of vectors and the matrix itself. Those things are not interchangeable. I'm sure there are professors out there that don't care about that particular thing, but I'm not one of them. I want you to distinguish between the columns of a matrix as a set of vectors and then the matrix itself as the thing with the pivots. Any questions? And this is why at the beginning of the class, I outlawed the use of the word it. This, this is because it can mean, can refer to a lot of things. A lot of times you're using it, uh, when you use the word it, you're referring to something that is not actually the it that you think you're referring to. If in the problem statement I said, is the equation ax equal b consistent for all b in Rn or Rm, because m by n, if a, is ax equal b consistent for all b in Rm, then depending on how you structure your sentence, it only gets to refer to that equation. So if you say something like it has a pivot in every row, I'd be like, well, a matrix, an equation does not have a pivot in every row. Equations don't have pivots. Matrices have pivots. In which case you have to clarify, oh, I meant by it that the matrix A does not have a pivot in every row. If that's what you meant, that's what you need to write. Don't write the word it. After you graduate, and it's incumbent upon your subordinates to make their language clear for you, write it all you want. But right now, you're gonna look like you don't know what you're talking about. And as a student, your job is to try to look like you know what you're talking about. I think the best way to do that is to actually know what you're talking about, but I know sometimes shortcuts need to be made. I don't know how it is. I was a student before too. You know what I mean? So make sure that when you're talking about, uh, when you want to describe a subspace, column space, null space, our favorite examples, that um, you're listing a basis and you say basis for this subspace and not just say this subspace itself. Make sure you distinguish between those things. Note that a basis, oh, another thing to note, going back to the columns of a matrix as a set of vectors versus a matrix. So this set of vectors, B, this basis B, A1 and A3, this is a set of vectors. So you wouldn't want to say that B has pivots because B is not a matrix. B is a set of vectors. A set of vectors does not have pivots. A matrix has pivots. So when I write, if we write B is this set of vectors, the, the capital B is off limits to use. So you wouldn't want to say B equals matrix A1, A3. But this set of vectors is a basis, not the matrix itself, not a matrix. I just did it, the matrix. When I say the matrix, when we talk about the matrix in general, then we're referring to the uh, artificial construct that we're all plugged into. That's a completely different thing. I don't know why they called it a matrix. It's, it's totally not structured that way. 
You know what I mean? I know you're thinking, no, 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 no. We're actually in reality right now, but there's, there's no way to verify that we are or are not just in some artificial construct. I'm not even sure that we could say it's unlikely that we're not in an artificial construct because we have no way of knowing one way or the other. Right. So at that point, we need to be pragmatic and we need to act like we're not, that this is actual reality. The pragmatic solution is to say, well, we don't know whether we're in the matrix or we're not, but uh, we should be pragmatic about this and not go try to jump off of buildings and stuff or fly. So that, that's the, pra the practical answer. Are you applying Pascal's wager to the multiverse matrix theory? Yes, I guess I am. Which is funny because I never apply Pascal's wager in the context of Pascal's wager, but I use it in other things. I think it's it's useful. It Pascal's wager in its original context, I don't think is helpful, but Pascal's wager in the context of the matrix, are we living in a matrix? I think it's pretty useful because I don't go jumping off buildings. Um, because I don't, I, I'm just gonna assume that I don't believe that I'm Neo hard enough to actually fly. I can't, I can't just R Kelly my way out of this situation. I can't be like staying on building. I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. Splat. So be safe out there. I, I agree. It does have application in large number situations where it's hard to know exactly the right thing to do. Yeah. So it's funny because um, some students are incredibly averse to guessing on things. And at, at what, the more you study, the more you should realize that all we've ever done as a species is guess. And then pass that information on to the next person that comes along. So someone's like, oh, hey, can we eat this plant? And then someone ate that plant and then they died. And we're like, oh, we probably shouldn't eat that plant. Then someone else comes along and says, should we eat this plant? So they go, nah, Bob ate that plant and he's dead now. So. Now that person might say, are you sure that it's the plant that killed Bob and not some other factor? At which point you're like, oh, well, let's do science. All right, go ahead, Frank, eat the plant. And then Frank eats the plant and then Frank dies. Like, well, now the evidence is mounting up. So whether we can actually discern what the mechanism is, maybe we should just not eat the plant. Just as or a solution. not with a side of paint chips while we're at it. Right, because that's that would be a confounding factor, right? It's like, oh, well, we don't know if it's the plant that killed Bob or the paint chips that Bob was eating. So maybe we shouldn't do that. You know what I mean? Correlation is not causation, but sometimes it could be useful. All right, uh, let's pause because I've been um, babbling on and I really just wanted to talk about the difference between the columns of a matrix is a set of vectors, the matrix itself as the thing with the pivots, and the column space of a matrix, which is the span of all the columns of a matrix. So that is a subspace, that's an infinite number of vectors. And basis for the column space, which is how we describe things. What are the building blocks of this subspace? Everything in the subspace is a unique linear combination of those vectors in the basis. Remember, it only seems like a lot to remember because it's a lot to remember and you have to remember all of it all the time in perfect detail and express it properly using the right words. So that's not too much. Let's pause the video here and talk about some other stuff.